65% of Linux servers are running RHEL or the enterprise Linux influenced kernel. That is a huge number in my mind. Um, landing source in that tree has a lot of impact and potential. Today I'd like to talk to you about some changes that the CentOS project made and why I think that's better for kernel and by extension all Linux development. My name is Brian Exelbeard. I work for Red Hat. Um, I want to expose some biases up front so you know my frame of reference. I actually work for the Red Hat Enterprise Linux business unit. Um, however, unlike almost everyone else in that unit, I have no revenue goals. My revenue goals are zero US dollars. I have achieved 4,000% of my revenue target every quarter that I have worked in the unit. Anyone in here who carries a number on your back, dare you to beat that. Um, I've had a string of weird job titles as a result. Um, we have settled on business strategist, which I kind of like. It's something I can say at coffee conversations and no one goes, what does that mean? And then I lose 15 hours of my life. But what I actually do is I work with communities and developers. Uh, my focus today is on the community half, so I'll start with developers. Um, on the developer side, I'm thinking about the long-term vision of how we make RHEL and, by extension, all of the RHEL ecosystem easier for developers to use and consume. Um, I have another colleague, coincidentally named Brian, uh, who works on the short-term version of that. So when you see things like our developer program, that's a lot of his great work, and then I'm doing things that are going to be three and more years out on that side of the fence. On the community side, I think about how Red Hat Enterprise Linux, RHEL, relates to the communities that came before it, like the CentOS project and the Fedora project and, and everybody upstream. I mean, I think about them from the perspective of where should RHEL invest? Not Red Hat as a whole, there's too much Red Hat investment in the universe, but where does RHEL invest? What are the challenges those communities have and where should Red Hat help? Where should Red Hat just be solving it? And frankly, where should Red Hat just get out of the way? Those are the kinds of questions that I tackle for the RHEL BU. Um, as a part of this role, I am the liaison to the CentOS project board for Red Hat. So if you choose to attend CentOS project board meetings, which I encourage all of you to do, there is one tonight at the famously great time of like 11 p.m. Um, but if you choose to attend or to watch the recording, you will find that I don't say a lot. And that is because I am the only member of the board who speaks for a company. So when I speak, I have to speak as Red Hat. Red Hat doesn't have a lot of opinions, uh, so I don't talk unless there's a specific reason for Red Hat to say something. And this goes to the fact that when Red Hat works with communities, we try to keep them at arm's distance from the business. Um, there shouldn't be undue influence from Red Hat on that community. They should be free to innovate and do the things they want to do. Um, and so like here, I'm, I'm here to mostly go, yes, you should absolutely talk to legal before you do that. Let me introduce you to someone. Um, or occasionally Red Hat actually has a position. Um, one last piece about that though is I rarely speak for Red Hat Engineering. I'm not part of the engineering team anymore. Um, when Red Hat Engineering wants to make a change in a community, Red Hat engineers show up and participate like every other community participant, even in communities where Red Hat is a supporter. Before that, I worked for the Fedora community. I was their community architect. So I've served in leadership over there. Completely different project, completely different structure. But I've got a background here. And lastly, um, I was an engineer for a while. For those of you who are actual engineers, I'm not trying to malign you. Um, I'm a mediocre engineer. Uh, I worked mostly in user space, uh, gluing systems together, and hilariously on a developer tooling project that has now been canceled, thankfully, for all actual developers out there. Um, and lastly, I put my Twitter handle up here if you choose to use Elon Musk's Twitter. Um, you may not want to follow me, though. It's mostly bad language jokes. Uh, not like bad language, but like terrible humor. Uh, and Paw Patrol conspiracy theories, because I have a young daughter. Um, I won't bore you with those, but I will simply say, Mayor Humdinger, I don't think he's actually a mayor. And we can talk during the break. So I started us with this 65% number. This 65% number was put together for me by uh, one of the research teams at Red Hat, and it's based on IDC data from 2020 on servers. Uh, it does not include any internal Red Hat data that we happened to have. We only used the data from IDC. And 2020 data was used because 2021 data is not expected until Q3 of this year. And I started as here to ground our thoughts in thinking about sources and code trees and, and enterprise Linux. 
And a little caveat on this, it's about production servers, so this is definitively not your laptop. Um, this is probably not picking up education and research workloads very well. Um, if you have a high-end cluster that you've brought up, it probably got picked up. But if you're like a lot of academic where you're repurposing other equipment, the long tail of hardware, the we built the machine by hand to get around procurement policies kind of servers, um, you did not get picked up in this data. For this, um, we called RHEL and all of the things derived from RHEL to be everything that Red Hat kind of has an interest in and the stuff that follows. So that's Oracle Linux, that's Amazon Linux, that's Rocky Alma, insert your favorite derivative here, all kind of lumped into Enterprise Linux. Uh, Fedora and CentOS Stream didn't happen to make this data set, but had they done so, they would have been included. Um, this is also not specialty hardware and embedded hardware. Um, I have a thesis that Enterprise Linux has a huge footprint in embedded and specialty hardware because of the characteristics it has. I just don't have any data to support that. So if you're in that space, I'd love to know some ANIC data to at least take into my next talk. This isn't a talk about RHEL, um, but I wanted to emphasize that this was market share data we're talking about, not revenue share data. And so I broke it out for you. On the revenue share side, um, and by the way, that's a reference to like Android versus iOS. Android has the bulk of the handsets. iOS has the bulk of the dollars. Um, so this is the dollars slide. Uh, RHEL and Enterprise Linux influenced derivatives are 76% of the paid operating system market. This data is really starting to get a little eh, because like, Oracle Linux and Amazon Linux, they're paid for, but it's baked into the instance pricing, so we lumped them in. Um, but like Oracle Linux, you can download for free, or unpaid, and use, and they didn't break that out, so sorry, it's all in. Um, on the other side, SUSE happens to have a product that is derived from RHEL, but since that wasn't broken out from the rest of SUSE's product, they're all out. So I'm hoping it, it kind of comes out in the wash here. Um, also missing from this is that weird part of public cloud where people pay like a support price on an operating system you can download unpaid mostly for the privilege of having one click start on a public cloud. Um, and there was no way to even pretend to count that. And I'd love to talk to anybody who does that because I really want to understand what you're thinking. So as I said, this isn't a talk about RHEL. This is the unpaid numbers, and I think it holds true that this 62% is also a significant number. Um, this, in my opinion, really talks about the fact that working in this ecosystem, it, it can really activate extrinsic motivation for contribution because you know your contribution will be having impact and be used, um, which is an important part of working in open source, at least to me. It also demonstrates that working in this ecosystem isn't just, you know, banking, or if you watch Red Hat Summit, auto. Um, it is a lot of different use cases and a lot of different testing. It's very robust. Um, also, I put this in here because a lot of people think unpaid and paid work very differently, and they don't. Um, they actually work very much the same. Uh, I gave a great talk in Italy, you should go watch, about the value that is wrapped around open source to make a product. That talk is right here on this slide. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting about this, and part of the reason I think this 62 number is so large, is because RHEL as a source code tree has updates for 10 years, longer if you choose to have truckloads of money, um, then that creates a long tail effect where people are going to keep using code. Um, I had the privilege of having a conversation with a large EU research consortium that runs multi-year experiments. And their words to me were actually, could you please make RHEL last less? Because we cannot get the professors to recompile their code. We will not keep supporting six. Um, so like, it's, it's, it's a long tail effect that has a, a, real, a real challenge for some people. But I want to change gears. Let's talk about the CentOS project. Um, let's go back in our time machines to November of 2020. It was a model in time. No. Uh, by the way, this slide and the next slide that looks like it, I stole from one of my colleagues, Melissa Lautenheiser. She's a product marketing manager in RHEL. Uh, one, I want to give a shout out to her if she ever sees this recording. And two, um, there's probably some language up here that feels very geared towards customers. I wanted the big part of the slide, and I'm a lazy slide maker. So please just accept that. In November 2020, most people viewed the world like this. We've got Linux, 
We've got Fedora Linux, we've got RHEL, we've got CentOS Linux. This is how people saw the universe fitting together. And a real problem with this picture is it basically has a lot of non-truth to it. it. This is really not the truth. It is beyond just oversimplified in a lot of cases. First, this implies that code is moving from the left to the right across this slide. That's not true. Um, it is true now, and it became true in April of 2020. But prior to April of 2020, there was no actual code movement from here to here. Fedora Linux did not feed RHEL. Um, and so that's one of the first problems that was challenged with like people's view of the world. A second is that it implied that when CentOS's trademarks were acquired by Red Hat to support that project, that the CentOS Linux team and the Red Hat Enterprise Linux team worked together. That was also not true. Um, it is true now, but it wasn't true then. Um, it didn't become true until October 2021? I don't recall exactly when. Um, but the point here is that that engineering team, the CentOS Linux engineering team, which was the project folks that we hired to help keep the project running, give them paychecks, to help them keep doing what they were doing, they actually sat in our open source and standards office, which became our open source programs office, which rolls up to our CTO, which is a parallel organization to Red Hat Engineering. So if those folks wanted to talk to the RHEL engineers, it's like anyone in this room wanting to talk to the RHEL engineers. You need an existing customer relationship or you need to find them somewhere in the outside world. Um, they had the same challenges. Um, one thing that is true, though, is it demonstrates a complete lack of influence from CentOS Linux onto RHEL because we're moving left to right. And some of that is left to rightism. By the time you write a patch on code here, the code here has moved forward and the patch may not be applicable, and you've got that communication problem that I mentioned. And some of it is that the way that the CentOS project was structured, it discouraged contribution in certain ways. For historical and cultural reasons, contribution to the CentOS project was very limited. And that was a function of the project board's governance and was something that was true when Red Hat acquired the trademarks and persisted. And by the way, just to be clear, um, I did steal this slide, as I said, from, from RHEL Product Marketing. That's why none of the derivatives are here. It is not an intention to leave your favorite derivative off the screen. So December of 2020 happens. Um, for those of you who don't know, there was a small announcement around, I think, December the 8th of December of 2020, where the CentOS project announced that it was changing the way that it worked. And what happened is that they moved themselves, these are distributions, not projects, but they moved themselves between Fedora Linux and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, the project did this because it wanted to exert influence in the space. It was one of many derivatives before this. Now it is an influential player in the space. It allowed them to change the contribution nature, and it allowed them to set up a place where you can explore the edges of the operating system, which really wasn't done or in many ways possible in the CentOS Linux era of the CentOS project. The benefit to Red Hat for this move was we had been looking to open source the RHEL development process, which leads to something else people didn't really think about. Prior to this, RHEL was basically developed in a locked factory behind a big gate. And periodically, we'd throw open the gate and we'd push a big box of RHEL out in front and go, y'all, how about it? And then we'd close the dates and go back in and tinker, tinker, tinker. Um, what we did with this move is we tore down the factory wall. You can actually come in and wander around and look at all the bits and talk to the folks who are running the machines, make changes, make suggestions. And we set up a duplicate factory in the yard, which we will talk about later in this talk, where you can come in and build your own stuff on the same basic equipment we have. Um, and this is a radical change. And Red Hat was looking for a place to put this. An easy choice would have been Fedora. And if you know Matthew Miller, the Fedora project leader, as well as I do, you will know that he called me a couple of times a week trying to get it there. Um, but we went with the CentOS project because they were looking for this influence change as well. So it worked out. This diagram reflects reality as it is today. Um, again, derivatives have been left off of this, not out of insult, but because of the who prepared the slide for me, because I'm lazy. So let's illustrate that with the kernel. 
Before I go further, I need to talk to you about when I say rel kernel. It is not one kernel. It is every kernel that Red Hat kind of has an interest in or that is derived from a kernel Red Hat has interest in. So this, after April 2020, is the Fedora kernel. Um, this is all the various versions of RHEL. Each one, each minor release gets its own little kernel that has its own little life cycle. Um, even though they come out every six months for various reasons, the minor releases of RHEL often continue for multiple years, um, long after you would think that they would have gone away. Um, and in fact, going further, I would argue that this is things like kernels derived from that source tree, and in Fedora, this is their shipping kernel, their previous kernel, the kernel before that, their rawhide kernel, and so on. I've mentioned April 2020 a couple times, so I want to tell you what happened. Um, a whole bunch of Fedora kernel engineers who, interesting trivia, you've seen this show before, they used to sit separate from kernel engineering, and then they finally got to sit with kernel engineering. Well, in April of 2020, they finally managed to do all the work required to get the Fedora kernel in front of the RHEL kernel. Prior to that, at best, learnings would pass between the teams. Um, but there was no code. RHEL independently derived a kernel from Lenis's tree, and Fedora independently derived a kernel from Lenis's tree. This isn't useful. We've put the line together. So what does that look like? Um, that looks kind of like this. Again, lazy slide maker. These slides are stolen from Don Zikas and Prerit Bahagravi. And Prerit, if you watch the recording, I'm very sorry for your last name. Um, they gave a talk at a CentOS dojo in 2021. It's online on YouTube. You should absolutely watch it if you're interested in the mechanics of contributing to this kernel, if you're interested in the use of source forges like GitLab with a kernel, and if you're interested in tools that make GitLab not a GUI. Uh, so that you can drive it entirely from the CLI. They do an amazing talk that I will not do justice to. Um, this is what post-April 2020 looked like. We derived a kernel from kernel.org into the Fedora project. And there are two kernels there that are interesting, Fedora Rawhide's kernel and the ARC kernel. Rawhide's kernel is Fedora's N plus one kernel. It will become the kernel of their next six monthly release. The ARC kernel, and I, I need to be clear here, I'm an American. We say ATM machine, ATM machine, the M being machine, so ATM machine or automatic teller machine machine. The ARC kernel is the always ready kernel kernel. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the ARC kernel is, it's an interesting relish kernel. So we take one source tree and we compile it with one set of configs to get the Fedora Rawhide kernel and we compile it with a different set of configs to get the ARC kernel. And those configs are rel influenced. You can think of them like the rel n plus one kernel, but we're not making any promises. Our primary goal there is to have a canary in the coal mine, if you will, of things that are coming so that we can see that flow of code. It's also had the fantastic benefit of we've been able to document the delta between RHEL in the upstream and RHEL in Fedora, and we can look at making that zero, if at all possible. So in this space, we can carry additional kernel patches if we need them, compile these kernels, and then every three years, we take the ARC kernel and we use it to start RHEL. We actually did this with RHEL 8. Um, December of 2020 started to change that. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about this box upstream first. Upstream first is an open source principle that I hope all of you know, given this audience. But it's basically the idea that you put code at the top of the tree, as far as possible in the, in the upstream, so that it flows down to everybody. It's the right thing to do. Everybody gets benefit. More eyes on the code. More maintainers on the code. Um, it, it's what you should do. It is what Red Hat believes in doing and is what we encourage every project we participate in to do. It means you shouldn't carry code outside of the tree. But I just told you we carry code outside of the tree, so why do we do that? Um, we carry code outside of the tree in basically two places. One is where we know it's being worked in the upstream, but we have to fix a customer problem today. And then we have the responsibility to make those intersect. Um, we don't like doing that. The other has been with things like Secure Boot, which I understand finally got merged into Linus's tree, 
And then we sell a real-time product, and not all of real-time is in the tree yet, so we're continuing to carry those patches off to the side, like a lot of other people, because um, we need those things. But continuing our story, let's jump to uh, December 2020. CentOS Project did their thing over here, and it affected this workflow. The big change being that now, instead of branching RHEL every three years, we branch off of Arc to create CentOS Stream. This is what we did with 9. So you may have noticed that, if, um, I guess it's over a year ago now, we branched CentOS Stream 9. And in fact, that means that the Arc kernel right now reflects more of a RHEL 10 universe than anything else, because we've been developing RHEL 9 in CentOS Stream 9. Um, a Red Hat Summit, by the way, is this week. If you want to go hear anything about this code base, um, there's a lot of presentations. It's online. It's free. Please go through the catalog if that's of interest to you. Um, RHEL 9 also is coming out soon. I don't have a revenue goal. I don't actually know when we ship our products. I just take my paycheck. But um, soonish. I think the announcement went out Monday, and the code ships sometime in the next couple weeks. Um, the CentOS stream kernel, though, has one feature here that is new, that was kind of an accidental but deliberate direct result of this change. The CentOS stream kernel is continuously updated. That doesn't mean it's continuously branched, though. We are deliberately backporting things into that kernel and making changes. And so what it does is, if you think about the rel kernel, it goes out in stair steps of change. The CentOS stream kernel is a smooth line. And so you'll get fixes, features, backports, et cetera, all over the place in that kernel to keep it running towards the next release of RHEL. Um, backports are a critical part of this. Um, and if you're not familiar with them, it's where we take a feature from the upstream and we put it into an older code base. That's critical for a lot of Red Hat customers, and it creates that fat tail effect I was talking about earlier. Um, it lets us have new hardware, um, but it also causes a lot of confusion because a lot of people will be like, oh, this is kernel X. That is old and tired. No, it is not old and tired. It has so much new code in it, like it is not old and tired. A and the worst of that is when you have a lazy security scanner that goes, oh, version X has these problems and didn't actually bother to check by scanning to see if those problems had been fixed. So. Another thing you may notice about this picture is that rel is not in this picture. So where, are rel, where is rel and, and the derivatives? A as my two-year-old daughter says when she plays hide-and-seek, here I am. Um, every six months, we branch CentOS Stream to make a rel minor release. Uh, the GA release is the same. It's just taken longer than six months because you go through a much longer stabilization period before that. Upstream first continues to be important in this diagram. The stream is now a stream. It is not seven parallel lines like it used to be. Also a good YouTube video, go watch that. Um, the two places where this creates a lot of confusion, though, is in Zstreams and CVEs. So Zstream fixes are when we have to ship a fix to a, a shipped minor release of RHEL. And they're named because of the dot, the third number would be the Z. When that happens, we have a bunch of people who stand around going, RHEL shipped to Zstream. I don't see it in CentOS Stream. They lied to me. No, we didn't lie to you. First of all, it might actually have been in kernel.org. It might have been in Fedora. Like, it could have come in from a lot of different places. The other, though, is that hash may never appear because of the way code works. Some Zstream fixes you never need beyond that Zstream because the code that it's fixing has already been rebased or fixed for other reasons. The upstream changed their views, et cetera. Um, it's also the same reason why you'll sometimes never see the commit in the original project, because the original project gets the PR, and they're like, we're not opening that branch for you. We are done here. This is history. Um, the other thing is, because of the way CentOS stream works, and because it's a constant accrual of features, fixes, and, and, and backports, if a maintainer is already in that module, for example, they'll just roll the fix in if it's needed, and it'll come out in a larger commit. So that one causes confusion. The other one is CVEs cause a lot of confusion. Um, CVEs are generally embargoed, so they cannot be shipped until a certain time. We are a business. We pay for all of this by being a business. We ship CVEs to our customers first. So they will ship in RHEL. 
They are then immediately applied up the tree as they are needed. There is no artificial block or anything on the Red Hat side. And what our engineers typically do is stage all of the PRs at once. But they hit submit and may they make sure that the code has shipped in the rel side before they go make sure everything cleanly applies in the rest of the trees. So I hope I've demonstrated a solid structure for this code base, this ecosystem, and for this impact that that 65% number represents. So why do I think this is better? I think this is better because you can get a lot of access to testing by working in this environment. Um, all of these systems, uh, Fedora Linux, is, uh, Rawhide Space, and an Always Ready Space, CentOS Stream, they all have test infrastructure, which even if your only contribution is to land a couple of tests for parts of the kernel that you care about, so you know if they're going to have a problem, that could be super useful for your project. That's something that's not necessarily available in other spaces. Um, the upstream first principle works here because you're still going to have to land it in kernel.org. But by working in this space, you can get some immediate feedback from folks, many of whom are going to be maintainers in the kernel tree. But also, you can grease the skids, if you will, for the back ports so that your code lands in production faster. It should never land in production slower. And it goes to that impact and that ability to get code in front of people. And lastly, even if you don't like RHEL, the Fedora Arc space gives you a lot of these same advantages. So you can work in that space and not in CentOS Stream. And the RHEL stuff is cleanly flagged off. I am assured that if you don't want to deal with RHEL, you will never see it in your workspace uh, in the Fedora space if you so desire. But wait, there's more. So for those of you who don't know Salt and Peppa and DJ Spinderella, they are still out there. Um, I will not sing for you, but I want you to know that they are there. Um, SIGs are not new. The CentOS project has had SIGs for a long, long time. But remember I said contribution was very limited. SIGs in the CentOS project basically did three things. They made the project go. Um, things like marketing. I would argue the project board is essentially a SIG. Um, they you know, did that kind of work that's useful for the project. They would build architectures for things that Red Hat didn't directly support. Um, it is important work. I would not say it's the Lord's work, but it is important work. Um, but it's, it's more derivative work, in my opinion, than it is interesting work. Um, and they would integrate technology above the operating system. So think about things like OpenStack, virtualization, OpenShift, those kinds of projects that needed a base to build on. Now all of this is done with the CentOS stream code. Um, of those three things that I've mentioned, the one that I'll say has probably had the most challenges is the integration above the operating system layer. Uh, we've introduced the two volume control problem. There's a volume control on my laptop. There's a volume control on my headset. They are independently turning, and I have badness in my ears. Um, that has not panned out in terms of those projects really haven't had this. But if you go to the mailing list, you will find some spectacular examples of where projects have hit it. Um, hilariously, the biggest one has been a case where the project knew code was coming and was waiting for it. It wasn't that the code moved too fast. It was that now they were all upset the code was moving too slow. So it was the opposite of the doom and gloom that was predicted. Um, I'm at this point uh, prompted by my speaker notes to remind you of a quote from Mike McGrath, uh, Platform Engineering VP, and he said, if we have a bug in CentOS Stream, it's a bug in RHEL. Well, if there's a bug in the OS and it affects your code above the OS, guess what? You have a bug now, too. So let's all get ahead of those bugs, and that's a, a benefit here. The SIGs, though, now can actually work at the edge of the operating system. They can actually push the operating system in new directions in a way that they couldn't before. There wasn't this kind of work in the CentOS project. And I want to talk about two examples today. My first example is the hyperscale SIG. This is not a great picture, I'm sorry. This is the best public domain piece of art of servers I could find. Um, the hyperscale SIG represents a SIG that has different requirements and use cases than the average raw customer. And so they need different things out of the entire operating system. Uh, the example that I'm most familiar with is there is a database corruption error that can occur in the RPM database. 
It is so infrequent, most of us will never see it. And if we do, we will not identify that it was the source of our problem. We will just go, well, that wasn't good, and build a new machine. Um, large hyperscale players, though, can tell you exactly how often this occurs, exactly how many of their systems are affected on a daily basis. So one of the first things that this SIG did, um, it brought together a bunch of large West Coast USA social media concerns who uh, came in and said, we have ideas for how to fix this RPM database. They actually proposed those to Red Hat because the SIG's code is completely separate from the CentOS stream code. Red Hat actually rejected the patch, and our basis for it was, it is such a wholesale patch, it will cause problems for our customers, but will enable the code that you need enabled so that it'll work for you. You'll have less patch to carry out of tree in your SIG. And this example, um, this is a space Red Hat is not invested in. I mean, we're invested indirectly because of the test infrastructure and code hosting and, and things like this, the fact that we help the project function, but we're not invested in helping them solve their problems directly. So their code lives off to the side. They do their own thing. They propose things to RHEL when it's important. And one day, this will probably have significant impact on the ecosystem. It just doesn't necessarily have it today. Um, the thing that has been really cool from a Red Hat perspective, if I put that Red Hat on my head uh, for these folks, is they have pushed us, and they have pushed us hard. Um, they have pushed us on infrastructure. Uh, there were some challenges with building kernels and replacing the kernel in the distribution that came out. They have pushed us on contribution methodology, pathways to contribution, how to do things like I need to fix this that is dead code in RHEL so that my code will run problems. Um, it has been super valuable to have these folks working on their own interesting problem off to the side, and that has enriched the whole ecosystem. Um, as I said, though, it's not a space Red Hat's directly invested in. So I wanted to give an example of a space where Red Hat is. Now, if my last picture was bad, this one is terrible, because this is supposed to represent automotive. Um, I am not a car person, so I felt weird just picking a car and putting it on the screen. My understanding is that some of you may be car people, so I felt really weird picking a car in case, you know, I picked the wrong brand. And I am not talking about this dude's laptop. Um, but this was the best I could do. Again, I want to thank somebody, Avopix, apparently, who has a, a licensable picture for me here. So Automotive Linux is the vehicle's operating system. Uh, there was, I've been traveling on PTO, saw beautiful Denmark, beautiful Sweden. Um, so we apparently made an announcement involving a large auto manufacturer who I cannot name because I just don't know who it was around automotive. Um, but that's, that's what I'm talking about. We have brought together these industry players and partners to come into this neutral space and work together in co-opetition is, is the term we always used when I was in education. Um, this is an area where there's not a competitive advantage to going alone. Um, we all need, you know, functional safety and the other components of an in-vehicle operating system. Um, and Red Hat is directly invested in this space. We have engineers whose day job is to go into this space and work in that, in that consortium. But a key thing here, and it, it goes back to that arm's length idea that I had earlier, is participation is an individual activity. So it's the humans who are doing this, even if they're doing it at the bidding of their employer. And so there's always space for other people to come into this SIG or in the previous SIG to do the work that's interesting to them that rides on top of this. Like we're seeing a bunch of people for whom this operating system is a step towards like something for a drone. Okay, fine, it, it's contained, it's got all these features and everything. The automotive players are uninterested in that, but they have the space to go and do that little bit of work on the side of the SIG. And I really like this idea that you're bringing together people who are going to have different ideas and different views. So that was what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, are there any questions, objections, or comments in the form of questions? Maybe can just spell out the C, what it is, and uh, like just a few words on, on Oh, okay, yes. Uh, the question was, what is a SIG? A SIG is a special interest group. Okay. So, uh, in the case of CentOS Stream, a SIG gets a space to write its own code. Uh, they essentially use CentOS Stream, that distribution, as a base. 
And then they write patches against that, and then they can build their own distribution media, their own influence kernels, etc. So in the, I know a little more about hyperscale than I do automotive. In the automotive six case, they're building specific tooling that helps. That they're assuming the hyperscale case. They're building specific tooling that is of interest to the hyperscalers, those large West Coast media concerns. Yeah, so it's some type of derivative, Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a way to have other derivatives. Okay. Are there other questions, comments, or objections? I think it was general motives. I, I. My partner, who also works for Red Hat, said something about GM to me last night. But while she is a trustworthy human, um, I did not have time to validate her claims, and I did not wish to accidentally be incorrect in a room full of potential car people. Well, before I go, um, I may not have mentioned this already. You may have picked this up. I'm an American. Um, I do live here in Europe. I've lived here for 10 years. Um, I rely on my European friends for a lot of things because I live here, like reading maps. Um, and one of the things that they told me was that if I go to Sweden and I give a talk, there's some kind of a law that I have to mention ABBA. <laughs> I don't know what to say about ABBA, so ABBA? But I do think this is important. One does not simply forget Ace of Base. Thank you for inviting me. It's been fantastic to be here and a great excuse to give my daughter her first flight, so thank you.